Hello, and welcome to a Digital Differential Equations lecture video for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we are going to be going through Chapter 1.1, An Introduction to Differential Equations. In Chapter 1.1, we introduce mathematical models to describe dynamical systems. Dynamical systems are systems that change over time. These models often take the form of a differential equation. For example, consider the temperature of a cold can of soda that starts with an initial temperature of 35 degrees Fahrenheit. If you place this can on a desk, it will start to warm up over time. Our goal would be to describe the temperature of the can as it changes over time. To answer this question and to develop the idea of differential equations, let's start with some definitions so that we can have some common terminology between us. First, a dynamical system is a system that changes over time. A differential equation, also just referred to as a DE, is an equation that contains some unknown function and one or more of its derivatives. An ordinary differential equation also referred to as an ODE, contains only ordinary derivatives. Typical examples would be y prime is ky, or y double prime plus 5y prime plus 6y equals 0. A partial differential equation, also referred to as a PDE, contains partial derivatives of functions. Partial derivatives and PDEs is not something that we discuss in our class. However, I reference it here for completeness so that we know there are other types of differential equations that we will be able to study in our future courses. The order of a differential equation refers to the highest order derivative that appears in the equation. Let's look at a quick exercise. Determine the order of each of the following ordinary differential equations. So when looking at the order, we're looking at the highest power of the derivative. So here, y prime equals 0.03y. This is a first order differential equation because it only contains a first derivative. y double prime plus 5y prime plus 6y equals 0. This is a second order differential equation because it contains a second derivative. y triple prime plus 5y prime equals 0. This would be a third order differential equation because it contains a third derivative. And lastly, while I have changed notation, dy dt still represents a first derivative, so this would be a first order differential equation. Looks like I'm having some spelling issues here. I hope this makes sense. Let's move on. In our class, 
we will only be looking at ordinary differential equations, ODEs, and save partial differential equations for another semester. To start building a familiarity with ODEs, let's look at some practical dynamical systems that we can see every day. The first of which will be Newton's law of cooling or heating. Sir Isaac Newton, in 1701, observed that the rate of change of a temperature, T, of an object, is proportional to the difference between the surrounding temperature, M, and the object's temperature. What we would like to be able to do is write Newton's law of cooling as a differential equation. And to write it as a differential equation, we want to translate the verbal description of Newton's law of cooling into symbols. Now to help you with this, let's remember what we have seen in our past classes. When we say the rate of change of the temperature T, here we're trying to describe a derivative. So we can say The rate of change of the temperature T could be written as dT dT. The rate of change of this temperature is proportional to the difference. So remember the word is would be represented by equals. It is proportional we'll have a proportionality constant k, and it's proportional to the difference between the surrounding temperature, m, and the object's temperature, which I'll represent as m minus t. Now, our author writes our differential equation assuming that k greater than zero will always be greater than zero, and this is called the thermal conductivity constant. It is a measure of how well an object retains its heat or its cold. For example, uh, consider a styrofoam cup versus a thermal insulated cup. They will each dissipate heat at a different rate, and this would be described by your thermal conductivity constant. Graphically, Newton's law of cooling should show us how an object's temperature changes. When looking at this graphically, there are a couple things we can identify. First, is there ever going to be a temperature for which dt dt will be zero? Is there ever a temperature when the derivative is always zero? Now remember when looking at this, k is a constant. That will not make the derivative zero. So looking at the second term in our differential equation, is there ever going to be a temperature t for which the derivative will be zero? We want to identify this is going to happen when your temperature is equal to M. Remember M is your ambient temperature, your surrounding temperature. If your temperature of your object is the same as the surrounding temperature, it will not change over time. I'm sure you could imagine that it would be impossible to take a cold can of soda, put it on a counter, and then watch it freeze. Similarly, you wouldn't put a hot object 
on your counter and watch it start to boil. Typically what you'd imagine is if you had an initial temperature, let's call this T naught, then you would imagine that as time goes on, the temperature of your object, your hot object, would cool down and approach the room temperature. So this would be what a hot item might look like. Versus if we had a cold object, maybe we would say our initial temperature T naught would be less than your room temperature, less than your ambient temperature. We would expect your cold can of soda to increase temperature over time and approach room temperature. In general, we'd like to be able to say that an object's temperature approaches the room or ambient temperature over time. Let's look at a couple more definitions. An equilibrium solution, sometimes abbreviated as just ES, is a solution that does not change over time. In our previous example, we would have said M is our equilibrium solution. If your cold can of soda started at room temperature, then it would stay at room temperature. It does not change over time. An equilibrium solution can be classified as stable if solutions near it tend to go towards it as T goes to infinity, as time goes on. And an equilibrium solution can be classified as unstable if solutions near it tend to go away from it over time. So here you can visualize what a stable equilibrium solution looks like and an unstable equilibrium solution where solutions tend to go away from it as time goes on. In our previous example, we could have said that our room temperature M would have been ref uh, ref uh, referred to as a stable equilibrium solution. Let's look at another example. Exponential growth and decay. Exponential growth or decay occurs when a quantity's rate of change is proportional to the present quantity. Exponential growth and decay is often used to describe the growth of populations of animals, savings accounts, or the decay of radioactive substances. Let's start with by again writing the exponential growth differential equation. Now to do this, I'd like you to recognize that we want to say that a quantity's rate of change, so we're talking about a derivative here, a quantity's rate of change, so maybe dPtd, the rate of change of a population, dP dt, is equals proportional to the present quantity. Again, you need your proportionality constant k 
and then your present quantity p. Usually when talking about a differential equation such as this, we will talk about an initial condition. Maybe we can say, what is your population doing at time zero? And we'll refer to this as p naught. p naught is going to be your initial population. Now when describing our differential equation for both growth and decay, we can say that if k is greater than zero, then we would have a growth in our population, and k would be referred to as our growth rate. If k is less than zero, we'd be seeing a decay model and we would refer to k as our decay rate. Graphically, we can visualize exponential growth and decay as starting at some initial population size, p naught. And as time goes on, we would expect our population maybe to grow and we'd be seeing exponential growth when k is greater than zero or we would be seeing exponential decay when k is less than zero. However, it would not make sense for a population to decay forever. We couldn't have a negative quantity of some species. So we would ask, is there an equilibrium solution to this differential equation? Is there ever a value for which dp dt is going to be zero? Now remember, k is a constant. This is your growth or decay rate. So the only way this differential equation is going to be zero is if your initial population is zero. So here we can say p equals zero is an equilibrium solution. Can we guess a solution of the differential equation? Can we guess a function that will satisfy this differential equation? Can we guess a function whose derivative is a multiple of itself. If I write this differential equation slightly differently, remember dp dt, I could be writing this as p prime equals kp. So I'm looking for a function whose derivative is a multiple of itself. And we should recognize there's only one function that does this. And you should be thinking, of course, of our exponential function. The only function that will do this is p of t equals e to the kt. And I will show you in a future section that actually it could be any constant multiple of e to the kt. So maybe we'll identify here. 
where C is any constant. To verify this works, Observe that if P of T is equal to C E to the K T, then P prime, remember a constant, a coefficient, we will leave that there, the derivative of E to the K T is K E to the K T. Rewriting this, notice that this is the same as K times C E to the K T but this is our original function p, so this is the same as kp. So what we have is p prime is a multiple of itself. And this makes sense graphically, as I've shown, our image does appear to be showing exponential growth curve or an exponential decay curve as time goes on. Okay, lastly, identify the equilibrium solution as stable or unstable. And here I want to say it depends on the value of k. If k is greater than 0, then p equals 0 is an unstable equilibrium solution because your solutions are tending to go away from it as time goes on. However, if k is less than 0, then p equals 0 is a stable equilibrium solution. Because we can tell as time goes on, solutions are approaching your equilibrium solution. Let's look at another example. The logistic growth model. Logistic growth occurs when a quantity's rate of change decreases as a population size approaches a maximum imposed by limiting resources. Given a limited sustainable population size L, the logistic growth differential equation can be written as follows. Where K greater than zero is always going to be a constant, and L is your maximum sustainable population size. Now the way we think about L in typically is that an environment can only hold so many animals. Imagine a fish tank. You put a couple of fish in a fish tank. Initially, there is plenty of room in this fish tank for these two fish to live. But as time goes on, they start having babies. It does not make sense that this fish tank can hold an infinite number of fish. Eventually, the quantity of fish will reach a maximum size because of the environment that they are stuck inside. Part A of our question is let's identify the equilibrium solutions of our logistic growth model. So for our, our, our equilibrium solutions, we're trying to identify where is dp dt equal to zero. Okay. 
And remember, your k, this is a constant. So the only time this is going to be 0 is if this portion of your differential equation is 0. And remember, whenever you have the product of two different quantities, two different terms, the only way that this is going to equal 0 is, is when one of those two terms or one of those factors is 0. So dp dt is equal to 0 when your population size is 0 or you have no population. And this makes sense. If you have nobody in your fish tank, you're not going to have any babies. This would be an equilibrium solution. You'll also have an equilibrium solution when your second factor is equal to 0. And remember L, this is your maximum size. This is a constant. So if our population P is ever equal to L, then that means your population is already at your maximum sustainable size. And so it won't be changing any. Graphically, we should be able to identify what our growth will look like over time. And generally, it's easier to do this if you start with graphing your equilibrium solutions. Remember, we have one equilibrium solution at p equals 0. If your population is 0, it is 0 for all time. It will not change. We have another equilibrium solution if your population is equal to your maximum sustainable size already. And now we want to imagine what will our population do if it's at a different size. So imagine for a moment your population was here, p naught was less than your uh, less than your limiting size. Well, if p naught is less than l, then let's look at our differential equation. I'm going to write it here for reference. If p naught is less than L, then dp dt, well, since k is a constant that's greater than 0, that's going to be positive. Here, p, that's going to be a, a, a value, but it's going to be positive. And if P naught is less than L, if P is less than L, then this quantity is going to be positive. And the product of these three terms will be positive, and we would expect dP dt, your derivative, to be greater than zero, so that your population would start to grow. And it would approach your limiting population size, L. However, if p naught, your initial value, was greater than L, then dp dt. So remember, we have k, our constant, which is greater than 0. That stays there. p naught is going to be your population size here, which is still going to be positive. But now if p is greater than l, this factor, l minus p, is going to be positive or negative. If p is bigger than l, this quantity is going to be negative. 
and so that the product of these three terms is gonna be less than zero, and our derivative will be negative, saying that our population will decrease in time. I hope this makes sense. We're just thinking about how derivatives tell us the slope of what a solution curve might look like. Okay, lastly, let's identify the equilibrium solutions as stable or unstable. So let's look at the first one. If P equals L, your population is equal to your maximum sustainable size. we're looking at this equilibrium solution. If P equals L, then this equilibrium solution is a stable equilibrium solution because solutions tend to approach it as time goes on. Our second equilibrium solution P equals zero. This is a, an unstable equilibrium solution. As time goes on, solutions tend to go away from this equilibrium solution. Oops. I moved my picture. They go away from this equilibrium solution. Okay, let's look at one last example. Here we would like to be able to describe free falling objects. An object falling near the surface of the earth in the absence of air resistance and under only the influence of gravity is said to be a free falling object. This object would accelerate because of gravity at a constant rate. And depending on your measurement system, if you're in the SI measurement system, then it falls towards the Earth's surface at 9.8 meters per second squared. It is common that people sometimes write a negative to indicate that it's going downward. If you're in the US system of measurement, then we measure things in feet rather than meters. And so gravity pulls things towards the Earth's surface at 32 feet per second squared. Part A. Let's write a differential equation to describe the rate of change of the position of an object. So here we want to remember that gravity pulls things towards the Earth's surface. Or another way to say that it produces acceleration. And from calculus, we remember that acceleration is which derivative? I hear you probably want to remember if you have some position function s of t, then s prime of t, first derivative, would be your velocity, and s double prime of t, your second derivative, is your acceleration. So here we want to write a differential equation that describes the position of an object using the fact that we know acceleration, gravity is one of these two constants. I could potentially write two different differential equations. One of them would be S double prime of T would be just negative 9.8 if you're in the SI system of measurement or you could write S double prime of T 
is negative 32 if you're in the US system of measurement. Okay. Let's solve the DE using methods of calculus to find the position of the object at any time t that is dropped with a zero velocity from a 400 foot tall building. So here we're being asked to choose which version of acceleration, which version of our differential equation to use. And because we're talking about a building that's 400 feet tall, I'm going to use the US system of measurement. And so here we're going to say S double prime is negative 32. We're also told that it's dropped with the zero velocity, meaning that your first derivative at time zero, your initial condition would be zero feet per second, because it's dropped versus being thrown up or down with some velocity. And we know it's dropped from a 400 foot tall building, so we can say S, your initial position, would be 400 feet. Okay, so let's find our position function. If we know S double prime, our second derivative is negative 32, then S prime, our first derivative, I'm thinking antiderivatives now, the antiderivative of negative 32 would be negative 32 T plus we would have some arbitrary constant of integration c. But we know what's going on at time zero. We know at time zero there's an initial velocity of zero. This should be useful in determining what this constant c has to be. So s prime at time zero would have to be zero. So this would be negative 32 times zero plus C, and we know this has to be zero. This gives us a way to solve for C, and we can say, well, that means C has to be zero. Which really tells us that S prime is just negative 32 T. Okay, well if the first derivative is 32 T, then we should be able to find our position function S. S would be the antiderivative. The antiderivative of negative 32 T, we would use the power rule. T would become T squared, and we would divide by 30, 32 by two to get negative 16 t squared. Again, some arbitrary constant of integration. But we should be able to figure out what c is using the fact that initially this object was 400 feet high. So this tells us s at time zero would be negative 16 times zero squared plus C, and this has to equal our initial height, 400. This tells us how to find C. Here, our constant has to be 400. So that our position function that describes this falling object, S of T, would have to be negative 16 t squared plus 400. This is your position function. And this should make sense. Think about what this equation will predict as the height of your object at a different time. 
For example, if t is zero, if t is zero, this produces an initial height of 400 when t is zero. However, as time goes on, this quantity becomes smaller and smaller as it gets closer to the ground. We can also verify that it satisfies our differential equation, because if s of t is this, we can say s prime of t. Well, the derivative of 400 or constant is zero, and the derivative of negative 16 t squared is negative 32 t. And our second derivative would be just negative 32, which is what we started off with. Okay, our last question now is, what is the position after 3.5 seconds? So now that we have a position function, we're asking what is your position at 3.5 seconds? If you have your calculator, please pull that out. And confirm what I get. I get that this should be about 204 feet. Above the ground at three and a half seconds. Okay, this completes all of uh, our first lecture video for chapter 1.1 of your differential equations book. This should give you everything you need to be able to complete your homework in chapter 1.1. However, I strongly advise you still read chapter 1.1 in your textbook. This chapter is full of a lot of great content, examples, descriptions, and that I really believe that you need to become familiar with, and reading it will definitely help you with that. I hope this uh, lecture video was helpful, and I'll see you in the next lecture video.